Hello, welcome to the CDXR Wellness Leaders webinar series. In today's edition, we're gonna have a discussion about medical professional and wellness patient trends in providing care. In today's agenda, let me spend a second on the Wellness Leader webinar series. The purpose is to highlight important trends and best practices in providing care in a post-pandemic world. We live in a very interesting times, as they say, and as we look at the post-pandemic care environment, it's important to look at best practices. And I'm very excited and frankly proud and 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 truly, uh, you know, value to have Dr. Charles Cabo joining us for this wellness session. Thank you, Dr. Cabo, for joining us. Sure. Dr. Cabo is the co-founder and chief medical officer of Pounds Transformation, a firm that he co-founded with his wife, Michelle. Dr. Cabo is board certified in bariatric medicine in OBGYN and is a fellow of the American College of OBGYN. He earned his medical degree at Nova Southeastern University School of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his OBGYN residency at the University of Connecticut. Uh, both uh, Dr. Cable and I, I'm from Boston, uh, down in Connecticut. We are representing New England well today, Dr. Cable. Thank you. More about Pound Transformation and their unique approach <clears throat> to patient engagement in a moment. But before we before we get started, as we go through not just the backgrounds, but the eight trends that we are we were speaking at the bulk of this conversation, the eight trends that we are seeing in the post-pandemic world around medical professional and patient engagement, that will be the bulk of our discussion today. It'll be a free-forming discussion, and I think a very interesting one. Before we get started with the eight trends, Mimi, if you go to the next slide, and this uh, broadcast is being produced by our head of XR Health, Mimi Than. Thank you in the background and the control room for doing so. For those that are not familiar with CDXR, we are a telemed telemedicine company, ultimately, and our mission is to support the medical professionals and their patients in their interaction in between wellness visits, in between doctor visits. It's a, a really unique focus and what happens, particularly when there's an in-person visit with a doctor, and what happens in between those visits. That's the focus of CDXR. If you go to the next slide, Nini, uh, what we do is we work with doctors across the full circle of life, starting with OBGYN, with family planning, getting to earlier childhood, doctors that are focused on young adults, uh, adult life, and it may not just be doctors, it may be a, a wide range of medical wellness professionals from nutrition all the way through the full circle of life into midlife, dealing with things like diabetes, which we'll talk a little bit with Dr. Cabo about today, and including end of life. At the end of the day, the relationship that we have with medical professionals is to support these professionals in their interaction in a post-pandemic world with their patients. And in the final uh, slide here around the background of CNXR, I need to go to the next slide. How we do that is ultimately providing HIPAA compliant support groups. It's very, very simply stated, we work with doctors to do wellness sessions. So in between doctor's visits, the doctor is able to say, come to a CDXR wellness circle. The doctor is presiding with their patients have like-minded conditions. At the end of the day, it's very important for patients to <clears throat> be around people that have a similar condition. And that condition may be from pregnancy and a very positive end to situations that are perhaps more, uh, more troubling end where they may be suffering from cancer and need to hear not just from their oncologist, but other people that are going through similar conditions. And that's essentially what CDXR does. We do it both in terms of a wellness circle and a Zoom-like environment like we are on today, or in virtual reality, so we can get to perhaps some of the younger folks that are using innovative technology and something that we work very closely with Dr. Cable on. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward here. So that's a little bit about CDXR, and you can find us at cdxr.com. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Cindy, I'd like to give Dr. Cavo a little bit of uh, opportunity to tell his origin story 
and ultimately why Pound Transformation was created and a little bit about your background. If you go to the next slide, see uh, to Nidhi uh, uh, to, to talk a little bit about Dr. Cable's story. Again, thank you for joining us, Dr. Cavo. It's very much appreciated. Let me turn it to you before we get to the trends that we're seeing on the background to you and your, your business. Sure. Thanks a lot, Chris, for inviting me to do this. And I think what you guys are doing with CindyXR and the um, focus you have is, is really pertinent and very helpful to healthcare. Um, as far as uh, where we had our, origin, our origins um, start, um, my wife, Michelle, saw a need with regards to the lack of education understanding people had when it came to food and nutrition and how it impacted their health. And so she floated an idea while I was um, practicing OBGYN that she wanted to start her own medical practice, um, taking all insurance and recognizing obesity as a disease, uh, which in fact it was, and insurance was um, reimbursing physicians who were uh, doing work in the world of obesity medicine. And so she started seeing patients in her kitchen, a uh, couple, couple patients at a time, and very quickly, the word got out that these patients were uh, seeing successful weight loss in a healthy and safe environment. She opened up an office, and that office became another office, and then a third office. And um, her story was actually was picked up by um, a Netflix documentary, uh, which was an international thing. And um, she made it onto the big screen. I left OBGYN to become uh, her sort of medical director, and um, Pounds was pretty much launched. So now what we really focus on is metabolic medicine and metabolic rehabilitation. Um, we do have a primary emphasis on uh, weight reduction, um, but we really kind of turn the tables with regards to how weight reduction happens and that we go after the root cause of what uh, goes on with abnormal weight gain and we treat that, uh, which takes a lot of work, a lot of follow-up, um, a lot of listening and some medicine. So we manage things like diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension. We manage patients trying to get pregnant with infertility. We manage pregnancies. We manage postpartum, manage all of that. And then some. So it's a complicated and complex uh, medical field. Um, and we just continue to sort of look at other ways in which we can reach out and touch people that seem to be sometimes just accepting a chronic illness and a diagnosis. Uh, for the rest of their life. And we know it doesn't have to be that way because we resolve those issues uh, every day. Excellent. I, I know we're going to get into a, a, some of the ways that you're currently engaging uh, as we go through some of the trends. But Nini, if you go to the next slide, I know that you have been doing a lot on things like social media as you look to personalize and expand the, the reach even beyond the, the, uh, the uh, office visit per se. And if you go to the next slide, Nini, I know that you've also been doing uh, a lot of interesting engagement uh, uh, programs that we've been watching as we've been going through some of the wellness circles with you, uh, be it on a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a fall or, you know, seasonal type of thing and using uh, a video and various other things. So again, congratulations to you on your engagement techniques. And uh, I think we'll get into a little bit more of that as we talk about the trends and how that's worked for you. and. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see how you're how you're doing business. Uh, with that said, if you go to the next slide, Nini, what what we would like to do here for the remainder of the conversation here is have a discussion about telehealth. You know, beyond CDXR, beyond uh, uh, pound transformation per se, to to rise up the dialogue a little bit and the thinking about you know where where is telehealth in 2023, and as we look at various ways of delivering it. Clearly, we are at an intersection of healthcare technology and patient empowerment, but that has been supercharged by a number of different developments, not the least of which is the in innovative methodology, techniques, and technology. But it has to be put, we think, in a frame given the pandemic. You know, the current trend in digital health solutions that prioritize patient engagement clearly have been accelerated dramatically as we look into post-pandemic telehealth. And if you go to the next slide, Nini, just to start the foundation here, the trends that we see, and there's a lot more trends that we could talk about. I'm sure everybody listening to this broadcast, there is probably nine, 10, up to 100 different trends. So we, we limited, uh, Dr. Cave and I limited to, to, to the top eight, 
starting off, of course, is with telehealth. And, and that telehealth is here to stay. So let's start with that, Nini, if you go to the next slide. And, and Dr. Cavo, I'd love to hear a little bit, you know, as we think about telehealth in a post-pandemic world, clearly it's an integral part of patient care. You know, we've got virtual visits, scheduled appointments, you know, virtual uh, apps now and platforms. It seems to me, at least, that it's not just a response to the pandemic. There seems to be a new standard, and that comes sometimes with good news and bad news. Could you tell take us through a little bit of your of your journey of of your business's journey through the pandemic? It's it's been a fascinating, you know, I say fascinating quote. It's been a very difficult period, but for the medical community in particular, take us a little bit back to 2019, 2020, 2021, and what it was like to to navigate a business during this time, and and what that means as we think about it moving forward in telehealth. So. <laughs> That's a funny question. Uh, yeah, I very rarely take kind of a uh, day trip back to that day that um, <laughs> the pandemic sort of reached Connecticut and uh, all non-essential employees were told to stay home. We had actually just opened up our third office. We had um, built the building. We had created an office that housed a kitchen that was, um, our vision was gonna be to utilize it as a pharmacy and a teaching kitchen for patients to come together. And then the pandemic hit. So um, yeah, we like many medical practices for several months wondered how we were going to um, pivot uh, and stay open. Um, and I actually had never really heard of tel telehealth, which is kind of, it's comical looking back at it. Uh, never knew that existed. I had no idea what the medical codes were for insurance, uh, nothing right. of the sort. And we are a small independent medical practice. We aren't affiliated with anybody that could pri provide us with the education, the background that other companies seem to be getting their hands on and, and kind of pivoting a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, but when we did figure out um, telehealth, and what a unique opportunity it actually provided us uh, because of the field that we're in. Um, we, we really embraced it. The insurance companies prior to the pandemic, their reimbursement rates were significantly different than what they became during the pandemic and even post pandemic. Some of the changes that have uh, been made um, persist and actually have been improving. And so I think that telehealth without a doubt is here to stay. All of the electronic medical records that any physician is gonna use has an opportunity to use telehealth to connect with patients. I think that to some degree patients benefit, to some degrees they don't benefit. Somewhere if you thread the needle, it is to everybody's advantage to be comfortable using uh, telehealth to uh, improve patients' medical conditions. Excellent. You know, it, it's funny to go back a little bit. It seems like a long time ago. It wasn't very long ago we were going through that. And of course, a very difficult uh, period, uh, particularly for the medical community. You guys were certainly at the apex of, of that challenge to make sure that care still happened, but obviously in a, in a very challenging environment. And let, that leads us to the second, second trend, uh, Nini. If you go to the next slide, the, the, this whole idea of convenience, you know, you, you getting a situation now we live in essentially a hybrid world, right? Uh, you, 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 as you say, you may not have studied this in residency school in terms of what telehealth was, but it clearly, as I say, it's here to stay. And if you could just talk a little bit about the the pluses and minuses of the telehealth world, you know, it's interesting because we're now a situation where there seems to be more convenience for the patient. Clearly, you can do things now. At, at you know online you can go ahead and meet you and not have to travel in, but on the other hand, it, it, it's still being worked out, isn't it? So uh, we see the convenience, but what is the pluses and minuses of this hybrid world from your perspective? So I think there are a lot more positives that can be um, seen through telehealth than the drawbacks. I think the drawbacks: you can't touch a patient, you can't necessarily. Uh, see them in real time when you when it, and when it comes to diagnosing different problems, uh, there are very few fields that don't need to actually put their hands on a patient. So that restricts us to some degree. Um, so the other aspect of 
a drawback for uh, telehealth would be just the connectivity that you have as a patient to a physician or a provider. There's just something uniquely different about sitting in an office with a person that can't resonate when you're on a uh, computer screen. And so when you're trying to get a patient to give you information, which may make them somewhat vulnerable, having connectivity and a relationship that they feel secure is important to establish. And that's a challenge in telemedicine, to be honest with you. Whereas in the office, like I said, there's something about the environment that happens in the office with two people sitting in an actual room and uh, you can connect with people. On the flip side, telehealth offers a lot of great opportunities for what you sort of alluded to, convenience as far as making appointments. You don't have to cancel half a day's worth of work to go see the physician or provider because um, you can just log on to your computer and not worry if somebody's running on time or somebody running somebody's running behind time. Uh, you also don't have to worry about parking, driving, finding parking places, all these things that can be real sort of glitches when it comes to uh, making it to appointments. Um, so I think that with regards to telemedicine and how we've been able to utilize it, it's been advantageous. You know, we can scale the practice a bit better. We certainly have reached. Uh, a lot more people in Connecticut and in the Northeast because of uh, what we can do with telemedicine, as well as some of the other uh, ways in which we work. So it's uh, it does have its pros and cons, but I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons when it comes to our utilization of um, that technology. Excellent. And and how how do you think it's affected your staff? You know, as as you think about their uh, ability to to work. Uh, convenience around telemedicine perhaps, or frankly, the downside of maybe almost in some ways being too connected to, to patients. How, how has the staff reacted to the world of telemedicine now that it's been more established? For us, the staff has been, they've embraced telemedicine and the opportunities, opportunities that it's provided. Uh, initially, it was a bit challenging for them to figure out what their place was since they weren't checking patients in, they weren't checking them out, they weren't weighing them, getting blood pressures and, and this kind of thing. But along with telehealth and telemedicine came a, a, a branch or an arm from insurance called chronic care management. And chronic care management is something that the majority of our patients qualify uh, for. And our clinical staff uh, was able to have more patient contact through chronic care management because they could actually provide information uh, to patients. Uh, they were a little bit more freed up with time, checking in on patients and these kind of things. So I feel as though the staff made more of a connection now with patient care and patient management and feel even more part of what's going on when it comes to delivering good care. So I, I think the staff has really gotten used to telemedicine and they don't shy away from it. You mentioned the insurance part of it, obviously a very important part of, of the business, you know, the reimbursement of it. Uh, do, do you feel, and particularly in chronic care, as you know, we, we do uh, chronic care wellness circles at CINDXR, and if, if I understand it correctly, it's sort of the highest reimbursement levels coming from chronic care for ongoing things like pain management, which is great. Do you feel that uh, given that it was sort of a jump start of the, of the codes, you know, the, the insurance codes for reimbursement, do you feel like it, it, over the last few years that uh, that the reimbursement process for virtual care is sort of now uh, consistent in terms of getting reimbursed or just in general, the processing, the paperwork, if you will, that it's all evened out where you see profitability around uh, telemedicine that's akin to perhaps in-person uh, uh, treatment? Uh, if there's anybody in the insurance industry listening, I'm going to apologize. Uh, before I answer this question, no. Uh, the answer, Chris, is no. There's, Truth matters. Please continue. <laughs> there is nothing easy whatsoever for any uh, physician's office practice, anybody in the field trying to facilitate making life easier for a practice to thrive given the technology that insurance has been able to offer. Um, I feel as though while what you said is 
is accurate with regards to insurance helping grow and foster chronic care management programs because it offers an opportunity for people to stay healthier and out of emergency rooms, which is a financial incentive uh, for them. They seem to have the ability to change the playing field almost daily, keeping us jumping through different hoops. And fortunately, people that are helping improve telemedicine, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, the people that we at least deal with, they stay very much on top of the new information they get from insurance uh, and reimbursements and coding and pass it along, which does make it a bit easier to deal with for us. But nevertheless, that I don't think will uh, change. I think if anything, it's gotten even more complex as insurance tries to figure out appropriate reimbursement for people in telemedicine who don't necessarily need to uh, practice inside a, a large office building anymore. So I, I, there's a lot still to be worked out on that front. Understood, understood. If we go to the next uh, trend, Nini, um, you know, it, it's interesting. Let's, let's go to the brave new world a little bit, uh, Dr. Cavo. Do, do we feel a uh, potential here because there's more interaction with patients, there's more connection points, right? Via your, your Facebook, uh, you know, various ways of customizing care. You know, I guess the question is, are, are we accelerating to more, for lack of a better term, personalized care, right? Treatments planned, tailored to, you know, particularly in your business, genetic makeup, lifestyle, you know, do we, do we feel that the inputs now are happening so fast in a good way to do the interaction a little bit, knowing your knowing your patients, um, that you can get to more of an individualized approach. And are we at the point, you know, there's an old thing, you go from data to information, descriptive, you get predictive. Can we be more prescriptive now that we have more, per, you know, ways of connecting with to, uh, your patients and therefore to see an outcome that's more personalized or is that still in the future? Definitely that part of medicine is improving rapidly, especially in our field, because the way in which we can now through social media channels that we have interact with patients and in our field, that's critical because a lot of the illnesses or abnormal weight gain, for example, that patients have suffered from uh, come at a story in their mind sort of replaying itself over and over and over again. And when they hear the same story, I can't lose weight, scale's not gonna move, I've done this before. When they hear that same story over and over again, that's gonna be kind of the outcome. And for me to try to change the story on those kind of patients once every three months when they come into the office or what have you, it's an uphill battle that I'm probably gonna lose and that would be my story. But now I would say that with our ability to touch people through uh, our private Facebook channels or touch people through Instagram or what we've been able to trial with uh, Cindy, we use remote patient monitoring through doxing. We have all these different ways in which daily we can send a message to a patient to improve and change their story and personalize an approach to their care, which I think provides a much better outcome, if that makes sense. It does. It, and we talked a little bit, we had a, a picture a little bit of your uh, of your Facebook group. Can you talk a little bit about the role that social media has played to uh, give you an opportunity to extend your tentacles a little bit in a positive way to get feedback from patients and to ultimately engage what role positively and negatively has, has social media played? Um, as far as just the growth of the practice, it's been huge because we don't spend any money on marketing. So everything that we've been able to accomplish has come from word of mouth. So now we have over 300 physicians referring into us and 140 new patients you know, monthly. And that can't happen without social media and somebody who's had a positive experience blasting it out on their social media channel saying that they accomplished something in their health and they did it through this particular medical practice. So 
One was just growth and opportunity to help more people. When it comes to management strategy and helping people, um, we set up a, an open Facebook page and Instagram and, uh, and some other uh, parts of social media um, that anybody can see, but we also set up private sort of communities within those domains, like within Facebook that only our patients can be in, or in some instances, if we are doing a challenge, only people that want to be in a particular challenge can do. And so through that, we've been able to take people that want to achieve the same thing and make a tribe where they feel supported. They can share their own kind of stories, frustrations, and successes. And I think that that has uh, offered an awful lot of opportunity for people to improve their health where they probably would have been suffering had uh, social media not been available for them to plug into. We also use the channels for sharing uh, recipes, uh, for sending out uh, food specials at grocery stores when they come up for certain items that we think are great on food. Uh, we have a lot of different ways in which we're using uh, Facebook and Instagram. It's been it's been a really nice adjunct to the practice, to be honest with you. Excellent. And, and you you already you sort of dealt with a little bit in your answer, uh, Dr. Cable, regarding some level of of privacy or any type of privacy concerns. Has there been any downside, or has there been any uh, you know uh, uh, cautionary tale experiences that you've had with social media regarding your practice that you're able to share or has it been mostly uh, on the positive end all positive we're really careful about if we're going to share any stories that might be um part of a medical sort of hipaa angle we make sure that all parties that are you know presenting are comfortable with what's being presented um so that hasn't been an issue and as far as the more private group, for example, the largest private group we have has over 2000 people in it. And they very seldomly have any kind of issues that requires editing, editing or intervention from any of the providers or staff here at, at Pounds. They're very respectful and mindful of their privacy and um, are uh, cognitive of, of what line they can, you know, um, participate within that circle and not cross. You, you mentioned your staff. Uh, I, I, I would assume that the further interaction outside of the office with social media, that maybe your staff is more involved with as they do with social media support and and, and type of uh, just overall communication. Has, what impact has that had in terms of your staff learning more about the patient relationship uh, with pound transformation or or just in general their knowledge of of how best to treat people i assume that all the data interaction the data points and the further interaction from that has helped with staff training and just overall effectiveness or no oh definitely the through the social media especially say for example i'll give you a couple of i'll say that through the open channel um the staff and let's just say the dietitians, for example yeah. They can share their story and what brought them into wanting to become a dietitian or what made them come to pounds or some of the success stories that they've had. And through those stories, uh, we have people reach out and say, hey, I want to make an appointment with that particular person because something they said resonated. And I think that's really um, speaks highly of what you can see and do on social media is, uh, get people who would otherwise never show up for themselves to actually show up. And as far as the uh, private channels, when the reg when the dietitians are in those circles, which they always are monitoring questions and making sure the information that people are sharing back and forth is appropriate, I think that it gives uh, that particular forum uh, it, it's vetted already for anybody participating. The answers to the questions are good answers. You don't have to question them because they're coming from the staffing at Pounds, people that are trained as professionals are giving that information. And so I think that from a clinical staff standpoint, they have very much enjoyed participating in social media. 
especially the ones that have big personalities and aren't shy to be up there in front of a camera like this, right? Uh, they really go out of their way to be participants. They'll actively engage people. Uh, just last week, uh, one of them uh, presented an idea that they wanted to have an accountability group started the day after Thanksgiving and carry it right through January 2nd. And they wanted to have uh, patients who wanted accountability to join the group um, and they would run it with different uh, ideas, homework, challenges, checkpoints, these kind of things. So they get into it and it's really helpful for the patients, for the staff. Excellent. And well, that gets into the next trend. If we go to the next slide, Nini, you know, because you, you mentioned sort of the group therapy aspect, obviously something that uh, we feel very strongly have seen the XR to, to see the dynamic, to extend actually the relationship from the medical professional to a, a meeting with the uh, the uh, patient in a doctor's visit. And then you sort of have that dynamic in social media uh, to then extend it to group therapy. Obviously, that's something that uh, we've been working closely with you on. And it gets into a very interesting thing when we, you know, the historically, you know, uh, a patient would go into the medical building and see the doctor. And it's kind of like almost a hierarchical thing, right? It, it's interesting with social media and all of a sudden, you're seeing, for lack of a better term, adopting strategies around the retail sector, consumerism, patient now aware that, uh, frankly, there are lower switching costs. Maybe when we were growing up or generations before us, you had the local, the local primary care, the town doctor, if you will. Right now, we're in a situation where uh, the switching costs between various doctors or various uh, medical professionals is lower. Uh, there's there's a need now for much more convenience and transparency, if not personalization, informed decisions, and even to the point now where you know you have a, an environment through social media and frankly through Cindy wellness circles where patients are communicating with each other, comparing notes. You know uh, how has that sort of changed? You know you're providing care, or is there a leveling of the playing field? God forbid with the patients getting more information and that's making them perhaps more informed consumer of, of medical uh, services? So you and I talked a lot about this point in the past and uh, I, I really never wanted to consider because I was very much a, not an advocate for group sessions, group medicine, I per I really in my heart of hearts did not think that was a good idea. I, I thought it was a little bit too invasive for patient uh, care. I think there are certain fields that you can't have that kind of setting for, but I think there are many, many, many more fields of medicine where it is a tremendous benefit. So you've changed my way of thinking, as have a couple other people uh, over the past year or so. Um, that there's a ton to get from group sessions that you can uh, facilitate through social media. It has to do with, yeah, patients can get a lot more information and are smarter co consumers, I guess, was what you were saying. But I think that, you know, when you look at business models and how business is basically done, people get into a boardroom and they talk about a problem that they want to solve. And the more people that are in the boardroom who are smart, hearing what the problem is, they might have different ways through brainstorming of how to solve the problems. And so I think that what I've learned through some of the um, meetings that we've had with patients through this platform and a few others is that patients will present a problem and there'll be a lot of discussions about the problems that they're facing with a lot of different ideas about solutions that frankly i never would have been able to come up with had i just been sitting there on my own and so i just think that you get in group sessions a lot of opportunity to learn a lot about different ways in which you can come at a particular problem i think the group sessions become an issue if it's a group session where everybody just wants to present themselves as a victim, right? Because then everybody will leave the, the, the meeting feeling even more like a victim. So when we do our group sessions, 
we don't really like to establish that kind of environment. We like to identify a problem that we want to find a solution for. We want to kick that problem around, hear what people have thought about it, said about it, and then have follow-up meetings and uh, strategies to offer solutions that uh, might resolve that problem. It's been pretty cool. It's been a nice experience, I think, for patients and for clinical staff, to be honest with you. Well, you, you, you brought up a great point earlier when you talked about, you know, the, the day after Thanksgiving. You know, I think we live in a very interesting world now where if somebody has a certain condition, right, let's say they're just diagnosed, you know, they, there's obviously that that if it's a negative situation, uh, they're, they're, they're shocked. You know, they get home, they do the Google search, they do the Reddit search, you know, they try to talk to whoever they can talk to with their family. And, and what we're finding at CNDXR, at least, is that uh, although they can get that information, it, 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 it's not the same as in between doctor's visits, being around people in a trusted environment that have a similar condition. You know, and what you know, I've seen with you and some others where you know, patients of pound transformation or patients of you know, uh, you know, uh, Mount Sinai, where people are dealing with uh, you know, various other ailments, you know, getting together you know, under the doctor's supervision, right? The doctor is ultimately running the the, the wellness circle with our service at CDXR. But what we find is to your point is that there's a certain uplifting of people in live, you know, even if it's virtual or VR, it could be the headsets, it could be in person for that matter. But when they're there to support each other, there's a certain alchemy, there's a certain magic that comes into that level of support. And I think it does have measurable outcomes. And it's something that I, I always find fascinating where to see a medical professional that's treating these folks individually, when they're all comparing and contrasting their situation, all of a sudden you find a little bit more about their personal experience. And I find that very uplifting. And we're hoping, you know, certainly through some of the things we do at CNXR to help facilitate that doctor patient relationship, but enabling the patients to help support each other. And I hope that uh, coming out of uh, Thanksgiving, we see some of that accountability, we'll see. If you go to the next uh, slide, uh, Nini, it, it, there also is an interesting in the world we live in in 2023, the issue of health equity. You know, we see situations, you know, particularly at CDXR, we may be doing a wellness circle that's, that's driven by folks in the Boston area from the medical side, but all of a sudden, you know, you have people joining in from different, different places, could be in different places around the world that aren't used to Boston level care but are learning about certain uh, movements and, and health and various things. And this is right to the whole overall issue of health equity. How do you improve outcomes through diverse patient populations, policies, and procedures to deal with these disparities? Have you found that telemedicine or, uh, you know, or can you foresee that, that this sort of leveling of the playing field, be it the consumerism aspect or the technology aspects, will help sort of help equity, health equity in terms of getting patients care that perhaps they could not do on their own if there wasn't telemedicine? Yeah, I mean, I think you asked the question, but I, I, I hope the answer is already obvious. It's yes. I mean, from our standpoint, for example, we have patients that can't ambulate because they're so sick. So they can't get out of bed. They can't move around their house. You know, it's very hard to move somebody that's 500 pounds. Um, and there's some people that feel very embarrassed about their appearance and don't want to present themselves to an office for people to see them and perhaps pass judgment and these kind of things. There's some people that simply can't afford to have a car to get here and they don't want to use public transportation. So all of these, um, you know, instances that prevented people from accessing healthcare seem to go away when you talk about telemedicine, especially when you're taking insurance because insurance is gonna reimburse for it. So as long as the patient has the capability of utilizing the technology, we have seen a tremendous uptick of people that unfortunately are much more sick than they needed to be if they just had access. You know, So now that they do have access, we've also seen those same people get a whole heck of a lot healthier and they never, they never would have. So it's, I think that's been a very interesting impact that telemedicine and telehealth has had. And even beyond the convenience of not having to get onto the bus or get onto the train or you know wherever you may be to get into the office, there, there's a certain element of uh, intimidation, right? Just going into a medical environment can, can bring people 
stress levels higher, right? Being into a hospital environment, seeing other people that are suffering from various conditions, it's a very intimidating thing. So it's it's very interesting to use, you know, this this new technology perhaps so that people can dial in or um, 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 uh, you know, or you know, get onto a call in, in an environment where they're they're home and they're not as intimidated by the trap by the by the the journey, if you will. And then if you go to the next slide, because that brings up a whole underlying point around technology, Dr. Cable. I mean, none of this would be available to even have this discussion, you know, 50, 40, 30, 20, maybe 10 years ago. You know, in some ways we got lucky in that everybody as we come into the pandemic was technology equipped right people had uh, a bandwidth they were had ability to do some level of of, of skyping or zohoing or zooming or whatever talk a little bit about the technology and, and i also wanted just to touch on a little bit there which is you know the 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 cost effective actness of this using technology but I guess also, is there a downside? I mean, are you finding that technology is your friend or is it just in some ways resulting in costs that you have to do in your business that that have increased because of it? Or is it ultimately a net benefit and a net economic benefit using the technology of today? There's a lot to unwrap, uh, unpack there. Um, for, first, I will say that when it comes to any health provider or practice that's listening or uh, learning about the technology and is interested in, uh, in, in this, there's always a price when you uh, put technology or improve your technology in your office. Uh, so there's that overhead that's going to increase. However, I had some previous thoughts about this slide and what we we're going to talk about, but you just, you said something that I, again, hadn't thought up. Uh, thought of until now. And that is, if I were going to compare, if I was looking at this all over again, setting up a practice and, and where I'd put technology uh, on, uh, on a level of importance, I would have ratcheted it so further up because what you said was interesting. One of the biggest problems that a practice faces is canceled appointments. So, when you look at how many patients are gonna potentially come in the day, and then you have all these cancellations because people can't show up, there's traffic, uh, they don't wanna get in the car, or they just get panicked about walking through the door of an office, right? That happens to people. That's, that's, what, you were, that's what made me think about this. It's mm. very um, intrusive to go into the office. It, it impacts your life, you're gonna be sitting there, you don't know who might be sick, who might not be. And then all of a sudden you get cold feet and you don't want to go into the office. And I'll tell you, when it look when you look at how many patients cancel telemedicine appointments versus how many are canceling office appointments, it it would be ridiculously different with regards to everybody shows up for the telemedicine appointment. So you know, this part of where technology would pay for itself, even though you do have to increase some uh, some of your overhead and getting the cameras and getting the technology into the office, it's gonna make it up in the long run when you don't have 20 to 30% cancellation rates. Doesn't matter how many times you send the notice, hey, Chris, don't forget an appointment tomorrow. Don't forget, call, hit, 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 see if you're gonna confirm. And, and still, every medical practice will complain about the no-shows. That, that drives up the cost profoundly. So what telemedicine does, what these tech-driven sort of interactions with patients do, it forces them to show up for themselves. It helps the bottom line of the medical practice. It helps everybody have better care, quality of care. There's, it's, it's really, it's, it's just a profound improvement in the healthcare system. Excellent. If, if for no other reason on the cancellation rates and the, the economics around that, you know, telehealth is here to stay, I would say. Is there something about being too connected? Do, do you find in some ways that the availability of somebody to text you or your staff, you know, the interaction back and forth? I know one of the things that, that we do, as, as I, I think you know, uh, uh, of course you know, is that uh, we do what we call wellness webinars. And the idea behind wellness webinars at CNDXR 
is that through the wellness circles, you and your staff are learning about the questions that the, the, the eight people in that wellness circle may have, and you can extrapolate to the 80, 800, 8,000, whatever it may be, of similar questions that people have and the ability to, to broadcast it out on a wellness webinar to your full base is something that we, we felt that's valuable, and I know that, that you, 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 would, you do as well. But that said, is there, is there almost a, a condition of being too connected? Is that become an administrative burden, or is it ultimately a net benefit? I think that I've talked to plenty of colleagues that feel um, burnout from the technology and the um, constant open door that a patient has to ask a question or present a problem. However, I think that if a practice or a provider establishes boundaries that are reasonable for everybody, then burnout doesn't happen. I mean, at our practice, everybody seems to understand that you can ask a question, but because we have boundaries with regards to when we're going to be on a social media platform versus not, or when we actually are going to answer emails or not, uh, those boundaries set up a... Uh, a nice wall for preventing people from burning out. If you don't, you could potentially be answering questions every five minutes. And I know people who do that. So I think it's just a matter of making sure that you're the kind of person with a team that's okay with boundaries and that the patients that you're going to have in your practice understand those boundaries. And if expectations aren't delivered on, then there are other practices and providers that people can find that are probably a little bit um, more uh, policing their social media network and their and their social media portals and that sort of thing. Understood. It makes makes perfect sense. Uh, if you go to the next trend, Nini, the the you know the, the interesting thing about uh, self policing, of lack of a better term, or you know, this whole idea of remote patient monitoring. People have different uh, the devices that check various things. This is sort of the brave new world that's still nascent to some extent, but in some ways it's pretty advanced. I mean, you know, you can do things now with your watch uh, well, with some type of glucose monitoring that that seems to have real efficacy, a really a real measurable results and people being uh, a little bit more uh, accountable for lack to themselves or maybe to others <laughs> in a group setting, but in between doctor's visits where they have information about their uh, intake and in sugar or their A1C, what impact are these uh, positively or negatively, I suppose it's a little bit balanced, are, are these this wearable tech had with your practice in particular? So um, our re remote patient monitoring uh, is not embraced enough, I don't think, in medicine yet. Uh, I hadn't heard of remote patient monitoring until the uh, pandemic happened and then even after when it was presented to me a couple times over, I still was kind of slow to um, take take that on as another branch of the practice. But then we ended up um, partnering with a company called DocSync and their remote patient monitoring program. And basically now what we can do is we can get a device of different types, let's say a scale, for example, the scale has a chip in it. And when the patient who's on our remote patient monitoring um, programs steps on the scale, that information comes into our electronic medical record into our office. And then our dietitians or myself or providers can make comments and manage things that we're seeing based on the data that's coming in through the remote patient monitoring devices, whether it's steps, weight, blood pressure, blood sugars, all of these things become open access to us to see daily rather than to see a record that's been going on for three months in some cases for uh, where we had been. And so the remote patient monitoring definitely allows for better decision making from our standpoint. We can manage people much more re regularly, right? We can help them establish much healthier habits we can improve their choices, their willpower. We can help establish rules for them to follow so that they see more success in outcome. All of that could never be accomplished if it wasn't for remote patient monitoring. So it's been a true uh, blessing, I'd say, for, for a practice like ours and how we do things. 
Excellent. And, and if you go to the next slide, Nini, I believe there are a couple of examples of some of the things you've been doing uh, with, with remote patient monitoring. I mean, is there, uh, are you finding any downside with respect to false positives or liability, God forbid, or, uh, or anything else around the support of this? Or is it just mostly, uh, like you say, it's uh, more information is best for the patient and maybe there's some behavior modification because of it? Behavior modification uh, because of it, for sure. As far as liability goes, um, we've looked into that before. And um, by nature of what our practice is sort of set up for, uh, there wasn't a ton of liability to have. Um, as far as the technology uh, goes, some devices work better than others in this space. And so when we find one of the devices that's not giving us real significant um, information or has some flaws with regards to what we're seeing. Uh, we don't use it, uh, but certainly some of the devices that we have uh, work fantastic. And it, it really is a nice accountability tool. Patients like to know that we're watching uh, and they just have a sense of reassurance that they're going down the, the right path when we make comments right after we see the data that we're seeing progress and they can continue doing what they're doing. So yeah, it's been it's been fantastic. That's excellent. And I think we you know we have also seen uh uh and if you go to the next slide, Nini, as we uh finish up the, the number eight trend here, uh, you know, as you know, Dr. Gable, we have at the CNX our, our our check yourself applications, a series of applications that are sentence completion based so that uh, a patient uh of yours or any of the uh of the doctors that we deal with there in between doctor's visits and even maybe even between wellness uh, circles, they can sort of use the application to express how they're feeling, you know, how you're feeling today through a sense of, sense of completion type of methodology. And again, it's a feedback method methodology, not just for the individual patient, but uh, perhaps other people within their wellness circle, but then again, to the, to the, to the doctor care as well. We're coming to the last trend of trend eight. And again, we could probably go on for many trends here, but one of the uh, one of the things that's really perhaps a summary trend for all of us uh, for, for for all of us in this community here is this idea that you know we live in a hybrid world, right? Patient engagement through multiple channels involves some things we talked about earlier in terms of convenience, consumerism, you know, better health outcomes by meeting patients where they are. We talked a little bit in this call about uh, you know being in a comfortable environment, and calling from home, you know got the golden retriever next to me, which is a true story. Um, and, and that idea of, of, of being in a more, you know, uh, it's a stressful environment in general when you're dealing with medical issues, but perhaps being in a better environment, using things, not just email, text messaging, social media, but certainly in real life as well, right? Ultimately, the, 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 as you said earlier in the call, Dr. Cable, as much as we can be electronically based in various things, at the end of the day, nothing beats you know in-person connectivity. The question is how you have better support, better efficacy, and ultimately engagement in between the doctor's visits. One of the things that we are that you've been on the uh, forefront on, and it's still an emerging market here, is things like augmented reality and virtual reality. I know we'll be doing a uh, a CDXR wellness session with you and your your technology-enabled uh, 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 clientele and uh, tends to skew a little younger when we talk to things like virtual reality. But there is a brave new world of this so augmented virtual reality into the metaverse. I know it's early days. You're early adopter of technology, which we're quite thankful of. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about where some of the technology is going. And maybe we'll be a little bit of a futurist here and channeling our, our good friend, uh, founder of, of, of uh, Cindy XR Charles, uh, you know, Kirby. Where is this going and what are some of the brave new world technologies that you're excited about, be it virtual reality or, frankly, artificial intelligence, which obviously is a very, very hot topic today? Yeah, so I would say that with regards to where the virtual reality or augmented reality is going is really exciting for, I think, healthcare. It can... Say for example, in OBGYN, you can, you can really help reduce a person's anxiety if they can actually go through the doors of a hospital, go down to the hospital uh, labor and delivery floor, see 
what happens as far as when they arrive, see anesthesiologists doing what they do and uh, seeing how IVs are administered. All of these things you can actually uh, see with goggles on and whether that's virtual reality or augmented, I'm still struggling with the terms a little bit. <laughs> when it comes to um, you know, the engagement that physicians have in trying to establish connectivity on a flat screen through a conversation like this, it works, but I really think that the experiences I've had with the goggles on and, and talking to people works so much better. It's like you're actually there. And so the direction you're taking technology is to me fascinating. I know other people feel the same way and that's why you know, you're know you doing so well with regards to who's been reaching out to you to, to jump on board what's going on here because through that technology, you open up even more channels for um, scalable practices, health equity, good care, reduction of anxiety. It, it's just, it's a really fascinating time. Well, I appreciate that, and I agree with you. If you go to the next slide, Nini, and I, I want to make an open invitation as we uh, uh, finish up our, I, I thought, was really an amazing uh, discussion here today, Dr. Cable. But, you know, uh, from a Cindy XR standpoint, we are, it's true, we are looking very closely at how using things like digital health, gamification, some of the, uh, the telehealth and the, uh, uh, items we talked about today, personalized medicine, big data, et cetera, you know, the question is how that ultimately is not a technology play, but rather a human play, right? How does that in very measurable terms affect the human connection, if you will, or the human support between a medical professional such as yourself and the patients that you serve and whether it's in group therapy, whether it's in VR, whatever, the key thing, if you go to the next slide, Nini, just to finish up here, what we're trying to do at Cindy XR, and I encourage everybody that's listening in on this to reach out to myself, uh, to my team at Cindy XR, because we're still in the learning mode, right? We're still in the brave new world. We're still in the beginnings of learning post pandemic, uh, how to utilize technology, be it on the, on the phone, be it on the computer, be it on the virtual reality, augmented reality, and all the other things that come into play here about how to ultimately get the better outcomes, right? How do we better service the medical patient, which is really where we're all in alignment with. So if you go to the last slide there, Nini, on the summary, you know, just in summary, again, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Cable, for this conversation. I think we both probably agree that as we look at where we're going here, the overarching goal is to create a healthcare system that is responsive to the needs of the modern patient, right? Equipped with the tools and flexibility for the future of medical care. I hope everybody on today's session, you get a better sense of the trends that Dr. Cavo and I and his team at Pound Transformation, my team here at CNDXR and the network of medical professionals we work with, there are specific trends around patient-centric approach to healthcare. They come with their challenges. They come with their, you know, cautionary tales. But ultimately, the goal here is to have better engagement which is critical for healthcare delivery and the cost effectiveness of it, as we talked about earlier, the focus on satisfaction. And ultimately, as we say, it's in the being there wherever, however, whenever it makes sense. And I, I, I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Cavo, for, uh, for our discussion today, for your partnership, not just with CINDXR, but for your community and your leadership, and not just on technology, but ultimately getting better outcome. And I want to, encourage uh, those that uh, have questions for Dr. Cavo. Certainly you can filter them through myself, our team at CindyXR or directly through poundstransformation.com. And, and Cindy, uh, if you go to the last slide, um, I also want to invite anybody on this uh, broadcast that would like to join us and be uh, uh, the next wellness leader that we have a session with. Um, we're, we're, you're certainly uh, invited to do so. My email is christopher.hill at cndxr.com. Reach out to myself and we'll work with you to, uh, to to tell your story ultimately and ultimately help educate the the, the whole uh, community around what our learnings are as we move into 2023 and beyond. So uh, Dr. Cable, any final words of our, 
of advice or anything. I just want to say thank you again for a very stimulating conversation. No, thanks a lot for inviting me to uh, participate. It's been enjoyable. Excellent. Onward and upward. Thank you, my friend. And thank you for everybody for attending the broadcast. We'll end it now. And uh, we appreciate everybody's support as we work to uh, get best practices between doctors and patients in their relationship. My best.